gratefulness for all that you've put into our life, all that you've done for our lives, and the fact that you gave us Jesus Christ as an opportunity for everlasting life, for grace and forgiveness, God. We love you and we thank you. And as we stand today, God, let us just keep our minds on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing a little bit. Okay, so you guys are so lucky this morning. Because up here, you have like the best, the best. <laughs> Choosing to look at this that way. Um, and uh, for probably about the last year, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna give you just a little bit of background here. For about the last year, I have struggled really hard with how my voice is aging. And um, even though to some of you I'm just a kid, others of you I know you know what I'm talking about, and then others of you know that I I have aged. And um, anyway, I. I struggled with how my voice is sounded, and, and I get that warble, that ooh, church, you know, kind of church lady voice going on sometimes. <laughs> um, but I watched something this past weekend. Um, I don't know if you guys know about Carpool Karaoke with James Martin. Um, I, I love it. I, we watch it all the time. He like he'll pull in these people like Steve and when they drive around in their cars. You guys got a YouTube it. It is hysterical. It is like one of the best. So you have Paul McCartney, who is 76 years old, okay, 76, and the guy is still putting out albums, and he starts singing, and he sounded like an old man, and I was like, I can do this. <laughs> Paul McCartney sounds like an old man, I can totally do it. So you guys just hold on, I really feel like, I really feel like I found some freedom last night, so. <laughs>
voices are our instruments. So lift them up to the Lord, because that's what we have. We, want, we might not have all the music someday. We might not have it, you know, maybe one day when you're riding in your car and you're just completely frustrated and you need to sing. You need to hear your voice. Your voice is what Jesus has given you to give him praise. That's, that's, it's just very basic. And it's all through the Psalms. You guys, you can, I, I can list out a million scriptures. Sing to the Lord with all your heart. Sing to the Lord with all your heart. Sing this morning with all your heart. All right? Okay. Such a powerful and beautiful voice, she blew the fuse back here. Blew a fuse? Blew a fuse. Yeah. All right, people back.
have um, live music and maybe we'll just, you know, as a kid in this half of school, we were going on. <laughs> Not today, people. Let's lift up our voices and be really loud, so we'll help these guys out as much as we can. So let's have the kids come up, and while they're coming up, Jasmine's going to come up. She's got an update on her sister. Remember her sister riding across America on a bike? Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs>
awesome. Alright, you're up. Louis was the guy from downstairs. I didn't do it. That could be good. It's going to take a minute for the computer to come back up. If I could run the camera with everything, there would be no need for any of us. Keep stretching. That was two and a half. <laughs> no, I need two and a half. Oh. <laughs> Are you 
sure you use it okay if I bring it up here? So we had, we had our kids well checked in since this weekend, or this last week. And uh, when you go to, you know, the first thing our kids hear when they see that, they're getting shot. And so uh, we were telling, I told Gracie, if you get on the table first, you won't have to get a shot. Kim's like, what are you so she, of course, hops up on the table. The doctor comes in and goes, I got good news. Gracie's not getting a shot, but you other two are. And she says, I knew it. <laughs> so Benny gets up, and you know the doctor asks all these questions and gets to the doctor. So do you guys have any concerns? Me and Kim are looking at each other. No, and all of a sudden, Benny pipes up and goes, oh, we got concerns. Benny <laughs> so, had concerns about himself, which he got. So. How are we doing, Bert? Uh, we're, we're almost there. We're almost there. Computer's a little slow. Let's go into this song because we probably all know it, right? You're like committing me for something. Is this a new song? What song are we singing? Correct. Okay. Um, we're good. Oh my god. We're good.
lost enough without him to ask him to enter in and help us to love one another better? Are we desperate enough for him to move myself out of the way and let me be the kind of ambassador that changes a darkened place in the world? Am I lost enough without him to let him fully into the closets of my soul, a clean house? And am I desperate enough for him to help me become a better disciple of Christ, someone who understands obedience and humility that can help us love one another so much better, to impact a world that is desperate for that kind of love. Father, we love you and we thank you so much for the beautiful worship this morning. The time to lift our voices up to you and be a blessing back to your ears. And God, also, as we get ready for our offering this morning, as we receive it, Father, as a church family, may you hold us highly accountable for what we receive, that we would do good things for you within this church, but far beyond it, like all the way to Mexico, to Thailand, to India, to uh, Haiti, to wherever it is that we are offered the opportunity to be able to bless others and bring the gospel truth of Jesus Christ to those even on five bicycles and three or four people still in the support van. May you do good things through our prayers and what we give back to you. May we give back just a portion of what you provide to us with a glad and cheerful heart. Father, we love you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Okay, um, last week I mentioned that uh, I might start a series on family just because of, of how my brother left this planet um, on the 13th and while I was down there, and not having anybody around him uh, but friends, and that's where his family, so were the animals that he took care of, and I understand that. But God changed my mind this week, and um, I want you to notice that I have two of these things. Two thumbs, and neither one of them are green. Okay? And I'm not a green thumb uh, gardener, but I've been working in a garden, okay? Planted a garden, we talked about that a while ago, and that was part of my uh, realization that I am getting older because when I, I bent over and I did all the planting and all that kind of stuff, you know, and the next day my hammies and my back were just burning up. <laughs> And so this past week, um, when I got back, I noticed that our garden, which is not a big garden, but it's a good size for a first effort for this kid. Because um, just like if you look in the word construction in the dictionary, you don't see my name anywhere. There's not even a reference to Bill Hay. Okay? Under gardener, you don't see my name or face either. Okay? Um, so it's not a big garden, but um, a lot of things happened while I was gone in that garden. And do you know what it was? Weeds profuse weeds everywhere. And I got out there, the only thing I could really see, and, and Jennifer was quick to point out that there were weeks she could see some where the, the bell peppers were and some other things, you know. But all I could see was the corn stalks. And the corn stalks are up pretty tall. I mean, they're about, you know, this tall, which I, I'm excited about. The other thing I didn't know is that you're not supposed to water corn all the time. Anybody know that? No. I didn't know that. I didn't, I didn't uh, realize that until I was sitting on our back deck looking out at the corn, and the corn that's the furthest away from the source of the sprinkler, the water, is the tallest. And then it goes down like this. And I thought, huh, what's that about? So I entered, how often are we supposed to water corn? <laughs> and it said, Bill, you've watered too much. That's exactly what it said. <laughs> I'm hoping we have corn one day, yeah. Um, anyway, I got to thinking about gardening and how life began on, in this, on this world in a garden. And God is the chief gardener. And so I'm going to spend some time on gardening and, and talking about gardening and, and what it means. And Jennifer uh, texted me this. I want to read it real quickly. Uh, and it was about gardens. If I can find it. By Roger, Roger Kipling. And um, we were talking about gardens and what we should have, how, if we could find some good verses about gardens and such. And so she sent this one. And she 
hated the woman, did I? Oh, here it is. It says, Adam was a gardener, and God who made him sees that half of all good gardening is done on your knees. We are all gardeners of our soul. And the best way to remove weeds in our soul is to get on our knees. It's the hardest thing to do. Um, because Actually, it's easier than bending over and picking weeds. And, and I, uh, I told Jennifer this because when I was uh, young and in high school, one of the few jobs that we could have in Southern Idaho was working in the potato fields. First, we would do the, the sprinklers up, you know, carrying the sprinkler lines and, uh, twice a day. And then later, we got hired to go in and weed the potato plants. And you've heard me say slacker bill many times in my life, okay? So I'm out there, we're, we're picking, guys are all over the place, picking these weeds, and they are everywhere, just like in my garden, okay? Just picking weeds and stuff like this. And, and I'm working for what seems like an eternity, and I look up and I've only moved this far on this whole row of potato, potato plants. So what does Bill do? I lay down and crash everything down so that the guy that hired me thinks I've removed all of the weeds. <laughs> and it's a very brilliant move, don't you think? <laughs> Except for the fact that, that the next day everything is back up like this. And the guy says, how come you're not doing any work out there? And I said, I thought I did a lot of work and I got fired. Okay? I deserve to get fired because I took the lazy way out. The easier way, the easiest way to hoe is uh, uh, to weed is with a hoe. But you know what you also wipe out when you hoe? Plants. So I went out there and I got rid of all the weeds. Uh, and what's fun about it is just how peaceful it can be to, to get in there and dig around and pull and, and grab stuff and, and, and yank it out and yank out just weeds by the roots. And uh, I really hadn't planned on staying out there the whole time until... I looked up and I realized I only got three or four rows left. So I stayed on it. And uh, I'm going to show you a slide there. It, 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 first of all, I want you to know that I'm, I'm really, uh, they're not really green, but they're semi-green thumbs. So my, my, my garden is doing okay. But there's a, uh, a story in this, okay? So we're going to talk about God the gardener and, and working in gardens and, and how important it is for us to till the soil. To, to pick the weeds and to go after them with, with, without any hesitation. So I'm going to take us all the way back to Genesis. So if you have your Bibles with you, I want you to turn all the way back to chapter 3 of Genesis, the very garden story of our life with Christ, our, the way God intended us as kind of an intro to this. And what, what is great about this chapter is that it contains the gospel message. The lostness of man, the depravity of us as human beings, being the kind of... That's why one of the songs that Kim sang and the group sang this morning about God's reckless love. God's love is reckless because He sends it our way. He trusts us with His love because He loves us without abandonment. Most of us would not throw our love at people who turn their backs on us. Most of us would not again and again and again throw our love to somebody who gossips about us, talks bad about us, and hurts us in so many ways, we would pull back immediately. But God is reckless with His love in that I want to love them, I, I can't help myself from loving them. So this is about the lostness of, of, of human beings, the, the depravity of, of our hearts, our souls, but also the love of a, of a never-ending love in God and the redemption. Okay, and We're going to see all of that in, in the fall of human beings, Adam and Eve, the call of God, and the provision of God, just like the gospel message that we get in Christ. So we're going to start in verse 1 and read a few verses, okay, after verse 7. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, as God said to you, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. Remember, God had told both Adam and Eve not to eat of anything in the garden, except this one tree. Just like God says, hey, enjoy everything in life except some things. And it's there for us to understand that the exceptions are to protect us, to help us, to understand. But like every two-year-old, we're going to push the envelope and say, you really can't mean that. Come on, that's, that's where some fun was over there, okay? It says, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, lest you die. That's kind of a good option, isn't it? I mean, if I touch that or eat it, I'll die. Huh. I think that's something that most of us would probably listen to and maybe respect. 
And the serpent said to the woman, You surely shall not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took it from its fruit and ate. And she gave it also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves a loin cover. So we have, again, directions from our God. That's what this is. This whole package is about how much he loves us over and 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 over again. Even when we deny him, he continues to love us and desires us to repent and turn back to him. That's what this is a package of. But it's also a package of be careful lest you fill in the blank. And then scripture is packed with human beings hearing and listening and turning away from God. And God calling back out to them. Come back, come back. And then turning back to God and then turning away from God. Read Judges and you will see the story of our life. Returning, falling away. Returning, falling away. So this is about God or the, the human beings including all of us today, ignoring God's word. Ignoring what he says to us, his commands, his wisdom, his loving advice, and we rationalize what we do. Well, it was in my best intentions. I, I, I took that because I thought it was better in my hands. Okay, Something along those lines we always rationalize, but that the very root of sin is what? Selfishness. For you will be like who? God. That is a selfish, uh, a self-actualization kind of response that says, I need to be better and bigger than I am, and if I can be like God, I, I will try that. And so we see this situation that is repeated over and over and over again, and it will be until we go home, that in selfishness, we elevate ourselves over God. We put God in a place that says we're on equal ground. That's why I, I, I think that the, the double-edged sword of calling Jesus a friend, and he calls himself a friend, that he absolutely is our friend. But there's a double-edged sword to that, and that is that we bring God down to us rather than pulling us up to him. For he is Lord, Savior, King, and friend. The result of this, and we have to remember this at any time, that God's grace is going to cover us. When we repent and we turn back to him, grace covers us. But that doesn't mean that there isn't going to be a consequence or a result of this. The result of that is, and what happened in this case, is a separation from God and our intimate relationship with Him. A broken relationship. Okay, So let's read verses 8 and 9 because we're going to start to see an opportunity for redemption. A way back into God's grace. Verse 8. Remember, they, they realized they were naked. And they sewed together fig leaves to cover themselves up. Verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. First of all, God is walking in the garden. You know how fun it is to walk in a garden that you've worked in for a little while? I love going out to that garden and looking at it. And just thinking about what it looked like before and what it looks like now. We'll sit in the backyard and Jennifer will look at the raised garden that that uh, we stumbled through and made uh, a number of years ago, and just you know, I hear her saying, I love my garden. I love the garden that's out here. It's so pleasant to look at. So here is the God of all creation walking in the cool of the morning in the garden. He's walking in that which he has created. He walks amongst us. He walks within who we are as a family and as individuals. And in, in verse, what am I at? Verse 9. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Now I want you to understand, if you ever want to circle this, this is God's call to all of us from this moment forward. Where are you? This is not a voice of someone that needed information. <laughs> this is not God who pulls up to a stranger and says, Hey, can you tell me where this is at? God didn't even have Siri. Did he? God didn't even have Siri to call, Hey, Siri, where are Adam and Eve? He knew where they were. Yet he calls out, just like he does to us. He knows where we're at, whatever state we happen to be in, yet he still calls to us. Bill, where are you? It's not the voice of an angry God either. Remember that. This is the voice that of not an angry God who wants to bring hell and damnation 
to, upon them. Now, the consequences of their sin is going to bring some serious stuff to their lives. But this is a God, a cry of a broken-hearted God, searching for those that He loves. I want you to think about someone in your life that's broken-hearted because of something that you've done. I think about, I've said this before, when I nearly walked away from Jennifer and my kids 25 years ago. Does it take long for me to look back on those memories and see broken-heartedness everywhere? And all the people whose hearts are, or whose lives are broken-hearted, all they're asking is, where are you? Why have you gone? Just like God was saying, Adam and Eve, where are you? Where are you? When something's broken, it needs fix, it needs restoration, it needs healing. And only God can really heal. We might cover it up with a band-aid of emotional kind of things, but it's God who brings complete restoration to our soul and our heart, to relationships, to families, etc. Disobedience breaks the fellowship that brings restoration, but it is God who wants to heal and restore us. God, was, God says, I'm going to restore this. And so in verse 10, let me find verse 10. So that we, we hid from you because we were naked. Okay? And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, this is where one of the other options comes in for people. Okay, There's three things that happen to people when they're caught. First is, I didn't do that. You know, I'm going to hide behind the, 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 the facade of what I've done is okay, what I've done is right, it doesn't matter. I'm right in this. Then comes something else, that is we hide in shame. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. And then this one, we blame others. Because Adam says this, Hey, the woman whom you gave to me, gave me this fruit that I ate. So not only is Adam saying it's her fault, but he's saying it's your fault. It's a bold person. But, I'm telling you, we do it all the time. How could God have allowed that? Why would a vengeful God do that to someone's family? We do it all the time. We blame God as human beings for so much. Because it displaces that which we could be doing. How could God let the hungry go the way they are? Turn that around and say, what am I doing to help the hungry and the homeless? why I love about you all, that every Christmas we get a chance to, to uh, bowl and have fun, but to take things out to people who are in need. We put things in action, and that I am so proud to be a part of with you all. Over, I don't know how many, well over 100 families, maybe closer to 200 families over the years of the vineyard that we've been able to bless. This woman whom you gave to me, she gave it from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you have done? And the woman said, He's gonna, she's going to give it the old Flip Wilson line. How many of you remember Flip Wilson? Let's just see that. Okay, a few of you. You know what the line is, then, don't you? The devil made me do it. I had control of myself, but the devil made me do it. And that's what she said. The serpent deceived me and I ate. So they did confess. I was naked and I had to hide it. Who told you that? Well, what happened? You ate from the tree of life? Yeah, but she made me do it, but that's the woman you gave to me. And then, oh, wait a minute, the enemy, the, the devil made me do it. Now, God is going to provide something, you know, but I'm going to bring it back to this. Sin lays us bare before God. Remember that. Now, it would be highly embarrassing and rather uh, ugly and crude if I walked in naked. Some of you are like, did you just say that in church? Okay, what would be worse is if I stood here fully clothed, but every sin in my life was fully exposed. Aren't you glad that we can't see each other's sins? Aren't you glad that as we don't, as we walk around, we don't see these neon signs flashing about every sin that's in our life? Because when we come to church, we think that we're okay. And we are because we're loved by a God who gets past all that neon sin. Gets past it all. But it would be embarrassing if we could see each other's sins. It would bring shame and embarrassment to us. We wouldn't be in here. That's what I love also about our church family is that we love one another without casting judgment. There's a difference between judgment and discernment. Discernment about the truth of God and judging others before God has had a chance to do what he needs to do in that person's life. 
The enemy wants us to be focused only on the sin and not on the love of God. Sin causes us to shrink, to pull back. The enemy wants that exactly. He doesn't want us coming into church. He doesn't want us diving into the Word of God. He doesn't want us seeking help and assistance from others to get back on track with the truth. Again, going back to what Jennifer and I went through in, in Portland before we came here. Walking away from my family and in way, many, many ways, God. And I had a good friend of mine who said, you're going to meet with me. I said, I'm not going to meet with you. He said, yes, you are. Every week. I'll come and pick you up. And he did. And we went and we sat down and we talked and he asked me such difficult questions. The first time that he asked me some difficult questions, I said, none of your business. And he said, yes, it is because I love you. Okay. The enemy wants us to focus on the sin and to pull back from fellowship, to pull back from him, to be afraid to read the truth of how much he loves us, but also how much he cautions us and warns us about things. But also when we miss out on this, we miss out on the opportunity to be restored, to be restored fully back into fellowship with him. To free us from the weeds of our selfishness and our sin. So I want, to, I want you to turn to Mark chapter 3 for another story. Mark chapter 3, I, I love this story um, because it is all about us again. Mark 3, and we're going to read verses 1 through 6. Jesus is busy healing, busy preaching, busy bringing the truth of the gospel message, bringing, bringing the incredible value and truth of how much God loves us. And so he's beginning to teach in the synagogues. And it says, And he entered again into a synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. I'm going to tell you this right now. We all have either today or before today or tomorrow a withered hand on our soul. We all have withered hands at times. Sometimes we help others with a withered hand. But we all at times have a withered hand. And they were watching him. Now, recognize that in the synagogue in this time, anybody that had any deformity, anybody that it was an indication that they couldn't be right with God. So this guy often hid back in the back. Because if he was seen with a withered hand, people would nail him. People would probably make him feel horrible about who he is. So he did. And it isn't like our God to seek him out. And they were watching him, meaning Jesus, if he would heal him on the Sabbath in order that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, rise up and come forward. Now imagine for a moment you're this guy who's just wanting to be there listening to Jesus and you don't want to be discovered. You don't want to be called out. You don't want people to see that you're there and with this hand. Rise and come forward, he says to him. Goes, oh my gosh, I don't want to come forward in front of everybody. And he said to them, is it lawful, meaning the, the religious leaders, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or kill? But they kept silent. And after looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. Now this is where I think it, it, where, where we are, are cautious when we come to church because we don't trust one another, we don't know one another. If this is my withered hand down here, and, and Jesus says, stretch out your hand, I'm going to stretch out the good hand. I want you to see the good part of me. Because I don't want you to see the ugly part of me. So here, here's my good hand. And Jesus understands that. Stretch out your hand. And then finally the man stretches out his withered hand. And he stretched it out. And his hand was restored. And at that point is when the, the Pharisees begin to really take counsel. And go against who Jesus is to kill him and to take him over. This man is like you and I. Like Adam and Eve. He hid. Did not want to be brought forth front to the front at all. But yet it is God who reaches out and says, come forward. Because I love you enough to restore you. Reach out to me. And don't just sit and wait for me. The sin of self brings about those three responses. Okay? And that is that we respond, we hide, we puff up and say there's nothing wrong with what I've done. Or the third one which we read about earlier in Genesis is that we blame others. It's my family's fault. It's my co-worker's fault. It's my kids' fault. It's my parents' fault. It's my spouse's fault. It's my boss. It's the enemy putting stuff in front of me when it's really falling upon us to follow the truth of what the gospel message is all about. Yeah, we get encouragement from one another, but it is God who says, take accountability for yourself and understand that when you confess your sin, 
That person can't confess my sin. I can't say to Lana, Lana, would you confess my sin for me? I can't ask Melinda, Melinda, hey, would you confess this sin for me? Because I don't want to do that. It is God who says, confess your sin, and he is faithful to forgive me. There's an accountability that follows or that precedes an incredible truth, and that is the gracious love and forgiveness of our God. That's important. I, as I was coming down today, I listened. I, I've really gotten in the, the kind of attached to, to some recent Toby Mac songs. Um, and one of them, it, it says this. Uh, it, it's, it, when, you, when, my, when love broke through, you found me in the darkness. I'm going to ask you to, to think about that when I show you these images. And, and Bert, I'm going to get ready to show you these images of my garden. Okay. When love broke through, you found me in the darkness. The darkness of sin. The darkness of distance from God. The darkness of me following myself rather than the truth and message of God. Said, And then the verses, I did all that I could do to undo me, but you loved me enough to pursue me. That is our God, because he sees what's good in us. Okay? Now we'll see if this comes out. See if this works. Uh, if it doesn't, I'm going to describe it to you. Okay? Not that one. See if it's that other one. Okay, you want to show you some pictures of my of my garden shortly. And, and it might be a little longer than shortly. Okay, so imagine a garden. In, in your mind's eye, just kind of take a take a, a moment to think about a garden that has you know it's got. Uh, I'm, I'm, I really wanted to show it to you, okay, because it's kind of funny. What do you think, Bert? We're trying. We're getting there. I'm going to show you that at the end of the service here, too, real quick. Um, okay. So when I went out to, to uh, weed the other day, and I got down on my knees and I'm weeding. Yes! Sweet. Go ahead and run that thing now. Okay, I think it'll, see if it'll come on its own or you can go ahead and click it. All right, so this is part of the garden. It's just a small snapshot of it. And what you see on the left-hand side is some, uh, um, I think those are uh, peas or beans. But then you see all the weeds over there? All that is weed. There's tons of weeds. And that's what the whole garden looked like when I got home. So I started working on it. But I want you to notice, I wish I had a little laser, red laser thing. Um, but up in that little, up in like the center, where there's a center bean. Yeah, nice. Over that way, just the scotch. Nice. All right. Right in that area right there is a plant that wants to be alive, okay? And our God loves us enough, just like what he sees in your soul, just like what he sees in us. He wants us to understand that there's, he's going to be busy. Okay, go ahead and do the next one. Okay, underneath all those weeds, do you see something? So most of us don't see that. I didn't see it. If I had just done what I normally would do, Slacker Bill would have gone out with a hoe and said, not getting rid of all these things. And I would have lost something. But wait one more time. I'm going to look right in that spot again after all the weeds are gone. Go ahead and click it. See this little dude? There's one carrot. That's a carrot. Okay? Now there's a whole row of carrots over on the other side. But do you know which one I want to watch very carefully? This guy. I'm going to watch him because he was buried underneath all of that junk. All of this, all the sin of weeds, he was buried underneath it. But our God looks and sees that and comes in and says, let me clear the way so you can breathe, so you can love, so you can function. Okay? That's what our God loves to do for us. If you click it once more, you see where he's at? I don't know if you can kind of see where he's at. He's right up there. Remember, covered up with weeds over there. He's right up in that little corner. She might even, I should say, she might be up there instead of he. Okay? That's what our God does for us. He looks down on us and, and lays laid bare before him, even if we try to hide it, are all of our sins, the stuff in our life that goes against the grain of the truth of the gospel message of Christ. Yet it's God who looks down and sees, huh, there's some fruit there. There's some good stuff in there if you'll just let me. Now this carrot had no choice but to let me work in there. You and I have a choice each and every day to let God garden or not. And believe me, we have withered hands, we have weeds in our heart, mind, and soul that God longs to get rid of, to restore, and to get away. Because he pursues us so much. Um, I'm going to tell the story and get ready for communion. Oh, wait, I want to turn back to Genesis. While I tell the story, let me turn back to Genesis chapter 3. Right We've got to read one last piece. In 
John chapter 5 is a story of the, uh, the man who is disabled. He cannot walk. And he goes to the portico at the, at the uh, pools of uh, Bethesda. And, and I, I, if you remember this, I talked about this pool a number of months ago. But this was a huge place. It's not just a small little uh, public pool or anything like that. This thing was a football and a half, uh, a one and a half football field long and wide as a football field. It was huge. Surrounded by all kinds of people who came to be healed when the angel of the Lord stirred the waters. But it was also a center part of where people would walk. Hundreds, if not thousands of people at this location walking by. And what does Jesus do? He sees one guy. Now there's a ton of other people who are, are hurting. Lots of other people who are physically disabled to get in the pool. Yet it's this guy who cannot get into the pool. And what is his question? To, you know, Jesus' question, just like uh, uh, God in the garden... Where are you? Jesus' question to this guy, like he asks us each and every day that we're struggling with, with the weeds in our life, do you wish to be well? That's like a no-brainer question. But this guy says yes, and he tells him to pick up his pallet and walk. Our God seeks us out and always asks the question, where are you? Do you want to be well? We might not even know we're sick. We might not even know that we're sick. We might not even recognize that our hand is withered with the sin that we've allowed to dominate or to carry on in our life. But it is God who understands that it's laid bare and all He wants us is to be honest with Him, with what's going on in our life. And then what happens, okay? Verse 21 of chapter 3 of Genesis. Now, prior to this, God brings the consequences. The consequences of their action come forth, okay? In all the verses that precede verse 21. And it says, And the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Does that sound like a God who hates? No. This, this is one of maybe the first sacrifices. It doesn't say what kind of animal it was, but I wonder if it was a lamb. Don't know if it was. But rather than God kick him out, you wanted to be, you wanted to have the tree of life kick, kick you out of the garden naked. No, I'm going to make sure you're clothed. I'm going to cover you. Later on in our scriptures, we read that Jesus becomes our cover, our righteous covering when we accept him as the Savior in our life. When we confess our sins, it is him that covers us up. That's an incredible truth. Thanks to Calvary, thanks to uh, uh, the cross, living in the shadow of the cross, we can always say, my sins are covered through the blood of Christ. The covering that God brought to us. Gardening is an awesome thing. We have the free will to say, God, come on in and work, or please, or we deny Him the opportunity. And we miss out on, like that carrot. I may bring that carrot to, to church someday when it's full, when we can bring it, a full carrot. God wants to work on our souls each and every day because He loves us, because He longs to have us in full relationship. We're going to get ready for communion this morning. And as we do so, I'm just going to ask you to <clears throat> bow your heads and close your eyes and just spend some time with a gardener. Spend some time with a gardener who wants only to come into the garden of your soul, let him get on his hands and knees, and let him pick weeds. Let him restore and allow your soul to breathe. Okay? So take some time in the quietness of your heart. Jesus was betrayed. He looked well into the future 
July 1st, 2018. And I'm so glad for people who reminded me that today was July 1st and said it's Communion Sunday because I forgot. But he looked into that time frame, time frame and he saw you and I. And he's still willing to go to the cross because we need it and because he loves us. Not just those disciples that were around the table and one particularly who would go completely against him, but all the other disciples who would run, who would run away, afraid. But he looked at us, he looked into the future and saw us and understood that we needed a, a savior, a God who would willingly crawl onto that tree and be beaten mercilessly so that we might have life everlasting with him. That's the kind of gardener that he is. And that gardener loves you deeply, madly, recklessly. <laughs> and he never quits. He never quits loving. On that night when she was betrayed, Jesus took that bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body which will be broken, beaten, drained of blood, put up on a cross, spit on, so that you might have everlasting life. He says, when you take of this bread, remember the sacrifice that he did. Then he took the cup and he gave it to his disciples. He said, this is the blood, my blood, a blood of a new and everlasting covenant. A new one that got rid of the old and was replaced with a new living kind of one that we can understand and grasp onto. Even when it's reckless love, we can grasp onto it. That the God of all creation willingly came to this planet so that we could understand who God is and how he loves us. And then to die willingly on the cross, spill his blood for the forgiveness of our sins so that we might have everlasting he says, when you take this and drink from it, remember my sacrifice. Do it in remembrance of me. And when we do this, we do it with some solemnness. Okay? That we examine our hearts, which is what we've kind of done. We examine the weeds and let God prune and pick. But we also come forward with joy in our hearts because the tomb is absolutely what? The tomb is absolutely tomb is absolutely yeah, a little bit better. It's empty because it's in us, the Holy Spirit. When we draw near to God, He draws near to us. And we cannot help but to be changed by a powerful God when we draw near to Him. We cannot help it. Change is a good thing. The righteous kind of change that comes with the covering of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a sweet time. It's a sweet moment in which we get the fellowship with our God. So when you're ready, come forward. And we'll, if you haven't had communion with us before, you're going to take a piece of bread and go to either side here with the cup, and that's grape juice in it. When you're ready, come on up and have fellowship with our God and our Savior.
share a little bit about where she's at, and uh, then we'll dismiss here shortly, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, for those of you who weren't here last week, you missed a crying fest, so it's okay. Um, <laughs> I cried a lot last week. Uh, but I did want to let you guys know I have something for each of you. It's just a card with my face and my name. Put it on your fridge, whatever you want. It has my email, and it has my electronic giving page also. Um, I also have, if you guys are just feeling led already to wherever the Lord's leading you, I do have these yellow cards that you can fill out, and I send them in the mail, or you can send them, but I'm sending a stack of things to crew tomorrow. Um, and lastly is, I have these letters that explain more of what I do. And for those of you who don't know, is I'm a teacher in Thailand, and I teach with Campus Crusade for Christ. Um, they sent me to a school called Grace International that serves missionaries by teaching their kids. English speaking school and I am beyond blessed to do it. And I do have two weeks left from today is my deadline uh, financially. And I know that God is going to provide but I know that there's a lot of things that are coming. It's 4th of July is this week so just I think some of the biggest things you guys could pray for me this week would be one that people even though it's vacation and people are getting ready to go camping or whatever it is that they just are still pursuing God and willing to hear what he has for me and it's the mission that he's sending me on um, and second is I won't be here next Sunday because I will be headed to Montana um, so big prayer for that and re- my relationship with my parents would be great because it's not, it's very difficult with them having an addiction to alcohol so prayer for that way would be great <laughs> so yeah also, uh, in the bulletin is a brief write-up uh, about um, Jordan and her mission. Um, be prayerful about that. Um, le- a week ago, she told us she was, I would say, significantly sure. Um, but right now, she sits uh, $2,800 away from uh, with a one-time donation and 10 people shy of $100 a month for her monthly benefit. So she has moved, God has moved significantly forward with her. Uh, so $2,800 is how she, she's got, I think she's going to have Crosspoint talk to them or somebody up there is going to be talking. Yeah, hopefully I've been in contact with a few people up in Crosspoint, and they, I didn't know that they were all connected to Crosspoint, so God's doing something up there. Um, so whether it's they join my team prayerfully or financially, just be praying for that. All right, let's pray, and uh, then we'll finish up and have a great day outside. Father, we are grateful uh, for the call that you put on our life to support, to encourage those who go out and do work in other countries, other lands, uh, God, and Jordan is one of those. And, we think of Jaquela making her and a trip across the country and, and others that are busy. They go of um, our, our missions in Mexico and in India. Uh, Father, just so many opportunities for us to reach others uh, and to be able to love on them in a way that communicates how much you love us, God. So, Father, today as we uh, finish up our time here with you, as we leave this building, may we not leave your presence. May we walk with you like you walked in the cool of the garden. May you walk in the coolness of our garden. May you continue to lead us to uncover and discover more about who you are and your incredible love for us. We love you, God, and we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. It's his name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a really good day today. Jordan has some stuff back there if you're interested and want to stop and visit with her, okay?